everyone. Um, I, for the folks who didn't see the, the, the very quick intro that I did earlier, I'm going to do a super fast uh, summary of it again, just to remind you why you're here. Um, my name is Rod Boothby. I'm the Global Head of Identity at Santander. Um, it takes a concerted effort, significant costs, to understand who somebody is. Um, to actually fully identify them for a bank, know your customer. This is not uh, this is not minor expenses for us. They're they're actually really significant, um, and uh, it requires even more cost and effort to protect that identity, to protect that identifying information. Uh, merchants uh, incur huge costs either because they are trying to keep in touch with uh, and in the requirements of, of privacy laws, or uh, because they lose that data. Witness things like uh, Marriott losing a hundred million passports. Amazing. Um, huge fines, huge legal costs, huge reputational damage. These costs and these risks uh, in digital commerce are all focused on identifying somebody. But why do we need to identify somebody? What we need to do is to trust them. We need to be able to trust the basic thing. And Basically, identity is solved. So we know and we can identify people. The problem instead is trust. How do we establish a digital trust? How do we create an environment where people trust each other? OK, so what does it mean to trust someone? Uh, trust is a key element in supporting digital transactions. It's the product of informed risk. The idea is we need to understand whether a merchant will receive payment, whether a customer will actually receive the product or service they demanded. Um, like for instance, my current experience at uh, uh, the, the, I won't mention the Crown Plaza Hotel, but they have no hot water um, for three days. It's actually, it was kind of interesting here because uh, they send me these things each, uh, every uh, six hours saying, Con Edison promises to fix the problem in six hours. And I saw a bunch of Con Ed people out on the street and asked them, hey, how long is this going to uh, take to fix? And the woman running the crew said, oh, about two days, at least two days. <laughs> so anyway, trust. Um, <laughs> okay, so at least you get an honest answer on the street, right? Not from your, your hotel. Um, that's a being informed. Um, so how do we build a trust ses uh, risk assessment? We, we look at um, basic things. We want to know, is this person who they claim to be? We want to know if they have authority to act. Like, for example, is this person really the CFO of a company? Is that person really in accounts receivable? Did they send me a valid invoice with real wiring instructions? I recently got an invoice from a very big, um, well-known consulting company for a heck of a lot of money. It was emailed to me in Word with wiring instructions. I could have, you know, gone to the Cayman Islands. It would have been fantastic. Um, about a year's salary, literally, like crazy. And that's not unusual, actually. That's quite common out there. Um, how do we guarantee that the information people share is valid and accurate? Um, say I'm applying for a loan and I want to be able to share a bunch of information about my income and where I live and all of those things. Um, how do I make sure I don't fat finger it or make a mistake? How do I guarantee that it's accurate? Um, and most importantly for me as a customer, how do I share summary information without disclosing private details. How on earth do I protect my privacy? So banks are in a unique position to protect privacy, to answer these trust questions and deliver a verified digital identity. There's demand for this too. If we look at, um, we've gone out to the market, and we've looked at customers out there, digital marketplaces want verified buyers and sellers, Industry, uh, uh, industry merchants need to know that they're, uh, who their customers are. Customers need to know who the merchant is. B2B participants need to know uh, that the counterparties are who they claim to be. All of these things. 
And they're interesting because they really change the dynamic. You can have somebody in Peru selling, I don't know, some handcrafted something or other for 200 bucks. If they're verified, I can buy directly from them, not through uh, a middleman. Could have a very Im big impact. Okay, so given all of these kinds of things, merchants want them for things like hotel check-in, for knowing that somebody's uh, that the the renter is is trustworthy or that the landlord is trustworthy same thing with eBay same thing with with uh, airlines that want to know that the person who's on the plane is who they claim to be they get fined tremendously if they deliver the wrong person with the wrong documentation to the wrong country um, like somebody sneaking on with false ID onto British Airways landing here in the States and ice will take care of them for fifty thousand dollars that's expensive for, for British Airways. They don't want to incur that kind of cost. Um, okay, so we want to try and solve these problems. And we think we can do it by protecting people's privacy as we do it. They can use us as a trusted intermediary. The easiest and fastest way to deliver this is to deliver this as a standard. The standard offers a level playing field, just like TCP IP, HTML, any of those things. Um, it means that all banks are in an equal position to offer it. And we think that there are multiple levels here. Yeah, sure, you could be a company with an ID and password. You can verify that. You might be a level two kind of company like a Facebook where you can do some multi-factor auth, but you don't really know who this person is. And then you can be a regulated entity like a bank, maybe a utility, that has to follow very strict rules and guidelines and has followed deep and expensive KYC. Um, and then finally, you could be um, an actual government issuing that, uh, that identity. All right, so um, we believe once in place, once in place with the open standard that you're going to hear about today, it's going to be very simple for us collectively to help fix this market. What we're looking for and the reason why we're here is we're looking for other uh, financial organizations and vendors um, and reliant parties to join us in this. It's a simple model. I have a, I'm a holder of identity. I go to, say, eBay. Um, they're a reliant party. I say, I want to be a verified seller. I've never sold on eBay before, but I want people to trust me when I sell my used bicycle for $1,000. Um, they say, okay, either hand over a bunch of information or verify yourself with Santander. So I go to Santander. I log in. I ask Santander, please tell eBay that I'm good. This is all done in a quick, simple UX fashion. The message is sent to eBay, and now I have a verified check beside my name. Um, and if they want, they can ramp up and attach liability to that. I can pay for it or have my buyer pay for it. And uh, the bank gets an interesting opportunity to generate profit out of that. Um, the, uh, the community and the market is more effective and more efficient because we've added trust. So as I said, we're looking for people to join our effort. You're going to hear from my colleagues, um, and they're going to work, walk you through uh, the, the, the things in detail. But please, if you're interested, take a picture of this and get in touch with us. Um, and then let me hand it over to Ildefonso Almedo, and he'll walk you through the details of what the protocol looks like. Thank you. Hello, guys. Let me uh, first introduce my, myself. My name is Ildefonso Almedo. Uh, I'm a software engineer, the director of innovation for Santander Bank. I also studied in the US for a while. I have an MBA by UCLA and a master in blockchain from, from Stanford. And I just wanted to say thank you to Finos for having us here. It's very exciting to be here at Santander speaking about open source and about digital trust. So first of all, let me start my presentation with a video to try to make a point that I would like to make through. The whole moral of the story is that um, when you want to build something that you want people to follow and that is scalable and adaptable and that has the right security, a protocol may be a good idea because otherwise you have this kind of issues. 
So that's how we are trying to solve the digital trust problem. Um, as Rob mentioned before, we are highly audited, but in our case, we see that as a benefit on the sense that we have really verified data in our systems. And the protocol is what we are putting in place to be able to actually give the control of their data to our customers so they can have frictionless user experiences in which they share what they need to share to actually get the services that they want to get. The benefits, as I mentioned before, is our scalability, the collective effort to put that together, and the focus on customer privacy. So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We know that there are some standards in the market that are trying to do similar things. So we did some research. We were benchmarking different options. And we decided that OpenID is the right solution or is the right foundation for this. So we are building on top of OpenID. The reason is because they have a massive community behind them. As of 2016, they have more than 6 million registered accounts. Uh, they are flexible and extensible. They are ad adaptable for different internal systems. So they support all the different tokens and JWS that we need to get the security that we want to get for our customers. Um, it has been used for open banking. For those of you that are not familiarized with uh, the UK regulation, is, it was issued by the CMA a few years ago. And uh, the regulation was saying that the nine biggest banks in the UK had to actually make their data available to trusted fintechs to get access to that data through APIs. So the fact that OpenID was already being used by FIs was a real uh, important uh, point in, in the decision. Then finally, last but not least, uh, they give us the opportunity to, or they give, you, they give you the option to have customer consent to actually accept a data request, which is very important for us. So if OpenID is there, how are we extending OpenID? Or what are we adding on top? So these are some of the Santander contributions. There is a more ambitious roadmap that we will see later. But some of the key points that we are adding so far are security. So security in OpenID is very optional. We are enforcing the security to ensure our customers' privacy. The level of assurance is something that we are adding on top. And let me explain the, the concept. If I'm going to buy alcohol to a store, that reliant party, that store, need to, need, needs to be belt and braces, that they have the right age to buy alcohol. So that needs a very high level of assurance. On the contrary, if I'm signing up for a social media site, I may not need that, such a high level of assurance. And we are adding that on the core of OpenID. Uh, the different proofs. So we have some cases in which you can do a zero knowledge, which means that I tell you, or I prove you that I am above the age that I have to be to buy alcohol, but I don't tell you my age. And in some other cases, you have very fine credentials. So we are adding all that flexibility in the protocol. And then we have the assertion claims, which is a full syntax that we are creating so that as a customer, I can share different proofs of different things without actually releasing any data. And the alcohol point in which I give you a true back if I'm about the right age is a good example. So some of the flows that we are working on, the first one is actually you start the flow on your device and end up the flow on the same device. Um, a good example is you signing up for social media, right? And you have a register or verified by Santander option. And here actually is good to mention another enhancement that we are adding on top of OpenID, which is the fact that we are adding that part of the protocol in which you verify that that reliant party, the social media site that you are sharing the data with, is a reliant party that you can trust. Next one. Another flow that we are building on is the one that you start on a device and you end up in other. And then the Mario example that Rob mentioned is a good one, right? I start the, the flow in my, in my mobile phone, and Marriott may finish the flow in their computers. And then I'm going to play another video to make another point. Without trust, people distance themselves from institutions and their leaders, from the media and businesses. Because trust is the lifeblood of modern business economy. 
Yet in a world that is more networked than ever, trust is harder to earn than to lose. So the big question is, how can we restore and sustain trust? Success will be measured by the public's trust, by the public's trust in and loyalty towards businesses like ours. To earn that trust and loyalty, we need to be sustainable. We need to manage change in a way that has an eye on the future, and not just today. Well, for those that don't know her, that's our chairwoman, Annabel Team. So that's how strong Santander is betting on trust. And how are we planning to uh, make that happen? This is our roadmap for the next few months. We started with the protocol documentation, which is already in place. We are finalizing the first server-side reference implementation that we will be testing with a partner in production in a live environment in a few weeks. It's actually giving us great feedback on the whole protocol and the flow and, and all the different interactions. We obviously were planning to come to Finos to look for, for colla collaborators and people that wants to be part of this uh, initiative. The idea is that we are constituting different engineering uh, groups to work on the, on the protocol that will be publishing the SDKs for the different reliant partners and partners to implement the protocol. And then we have already in plan a global hackathon with many different Santander countries that will take place in London in February. And the whole idea is to, tech, to test the technical assets that we already have in our sandbox and to start generating more ideas about digital trust. Finally, the idea is at some point in Q1 to open, to open the assets to the wider community. And that's our plan. And now I introduce you to Alberto Pulido, who will be extending the, the insights around the protocol and doing a, a cool demo about how it works. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alberto Pulido. Um, I'm a technical expert in Santander Innovation UK. Um, I'm going to take you through some more technical details about the protocol. As a question, is there any technical lead, technical expert, developer in the audience? Great. You don't want to enjoy this. <laughs> so, uh, first to understand where the protocol takes place and the different elements within the ecosystem, I have prepared this slide. Here, a normal interaction from the protocol it's very similar to what we experience today or the user experience today. So as a user, you may be using a third party application, could be a hotel, could be a rental car. And the rental car maybe is asking you some, some details. So it wants to verify your, your age. The protocol will allow that the Ryan party to start a conversation so that the ID verification provider will connect with the issuing authority, the information that uh, the, the holder of, the, of the, the valid data that you have. In this case, if we are a bank, as a bank, you can actually have that plugin into your own data. And then put the customer in the middle. So you, you redirect the customer to a logon, do your logon, normal logon process that you have in-house. In, in and once the customer understand what is the information that they are sharing after accepting, the relevant party will get the data. From a, a server-side integration point of view, a couple of things we have to consider on top of that. It's very important to have an audit log in case of dispute, somewhere we can reference to, uh, to check exactly uh, if something went wrong and the user can complain, or the relevant party. And another element very important is the directory. We want to trust entities, not only people. So it's important and following the same approach that Open Banking did in the UK, you have a directory and you have to be on board as a reliant party. But at the same time, you have a technical uh, element that you can use, uh, reliant parties can use to enroll with many, many, many different uh, uh, verification providers in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a very automatic way by presenting a software statement assertion, something like that. Okay, so this is even more detail. That's an example of a sample request and a response. When the protocol takes place, what we have is just a sequence of events happening, a sequence of messages that are exchanged between the different parties. In this case, it's the reliant party 
the identity provider and the user, which probably is running in a mobile application or, or a web browser. And in this example, you will see the power of this syntax, where we are asking very, very detailed things, very detailed assertions. We want to validate your name. We want to validate whether or not you have money in your account. And we want to validate your country of residence. And, and the language is itself allows for many, many, many different types of assertions and, and claims. And the way that we protect our, our customers is by just returning true or false. If that's the case, maybe the relying party is actually asking for the data. So all that can, fit, can be fit into the protocol. And we also protect our customer privacy by returning an ID which is different for each relying party. So you may have your own identity, but nobody needs to know how many identities you have in different places. No? So that's why that, this is the way that we are bringing the privacy in the core of the protocol. To showcase this, uh, we are going to run through a, a, a demo. This is a use case that is very similar to the one that we will put in, in production in a few weeks. It's not this company, this is a fake company, but the concept is very similar. So here we have a company that is offering quick jobs, temporary jobs. For example, now in Christmas time, people looking for just a couple of weeks job. And it's very important for that company or for the company looking, uh, looking for um, uh, employees to verify. Currently, you can do this using your, your passport. There are many providers. You go there, you scan your passport, you do many different strange things in front of the device, and you disclose all that information to the, to the relying party. And with that information, you get that validation that the user is, uh, is trusted. What we are doing here is do that same journey, but more, more straight, no? straight. You just click on verify something there, you enter your credentials, bank credentials, and then you see exactly what is the information that you're sharing. I can show you this slide. In a sec. You can see this. Okay. So this is our uh, Evelyn is looking for a job. Um, uh, we have some information in that application. She's looking for a job, goes to the notifications area, and there is a company that is asking for verification of that person before hiding. As I said, you can do the verify with passport, or, or you can just go straight, verify with Santander, enter your credentials, check the information that you, that you are receiving. In this case, they don't have your exact uh, uh, email. By the way, I, I mis misspelled the name of the email, but it's up to you. I mean, maybe they don't really need to validate your email. All they want to validate is your name and your date of birth. So you accept, and you get the Santander seal or whatever you want. So this is a, a practical demo or something that will be launched in production with a different company, but same concept. Um, just for fun, Let's see this in action. Do you want to see some code, some calls happening in the background? Okay, so for the, I guess that you are very familiar with the Postman collection. And if you also are familiar with OpenID, you may know this uh, well-known URL, which provides the details from the server, the capabilities from that server. You may be an open ID provider, but you may not support all the functionalities. So here we are we are extending the, that every single aspect of open ID. In this case, for example, we can tell the reliant parties what is the language that they can use to, to query. What are the operations? What are the claims available? And by, by setting a standard, we can extend this infinite, right? The important thing is that no all the op open ID provider, the verification provider will provide the same functionality. So it's important to have those automatic capabilities. So um, let's quick run through the, the, the Postman collection. This is the setup, which means that you have to have some private key. We are, uh, we are adding this functionality within Postman just to create another private key for you. 
And then the protocol starts in this initiate authorized. This is an anime point. It's following the same principle in, in, in open banking in, in FAPI APIs. So you have, before doing the authorize, you do an initiate authorize. That is the, the endpoint that allows the, third, allows the uh, OP provider to validate who you are and if you have the relevant access to, to the request such information. So here we are requesting exactly the claims that we want, similar to what I showed before. And very important, this is the purpose for why are you asking for the email. It could be a regulatory thing, it could be to contact you in case you, we have a problem with, your, with the service. So whatever that goes here will be presented to the, to the user. So the initial phase returns an ID, and this is the ID for, for the request. Then we do the authorize. Here we have uh, an example for a, a standalone uh, uh, single page uh, application or mobile application. In other situations, you just redirect to a website. But for the purpose of uh, this presentation, I am doing everything here. I am simulating, this is not part of the protocol. This is just the way that we are doing the logon and consent. Uh, so we do logon, we validate credentials. We obtain the information that will be presented to the, to the user. So we added that information and will be presented to the, to the customer. You provide consent, okay? So this is, these are the claims that I will be providing consent or maybe this time I don't do birth type. Okay, and I obtain a code. And if I put the code here, this is the token that I get. Very human readable, as you can see. But I have a tool. So here you have the result. So this is what happened behind the scenes within a, a protocol interaction. And I believe that's all I have for today, all we have for today. Um, remind you some last some labs that Santander UK. Come back to us. We are asking for, for help. Um, that's it. Thank you for your attention today. <laughs>